Well, hey guys, your friend Spencer here. Go ahead and hit the like button. And if you're new, go ahead and subscribe to this channel. We've been going through The Tragedy of Compromise by Ernest Pickering. This is really one of my favorite books of all time and thoroughly enjoying it. Now, we're going to go through chapter two for the next little bit. And I think you'll see a lot of parallels between what was going on back in the early 1900s and today. And it's funny to me that in my study of history, I, I understand fully the old adage, history is always repeating itself because really times change, circumstances change, but the nature of man never does really change. And so it's just interesting to see all that. Uh, but what we're going to talk about here is basically in the early 1920s or so and early 1900s just as a whole, you had the liberals and then you had the fundamentalists. And the fundamentalists were just really strong against these people. They were attacking the liberals. Uh, and sometimes it seems like, as human nature goes, they, they went to a little bit too far. Uh, there were attacks amongst fundamentalists versus liberals, but there were also attacks from fundamentalist to fundamentalist. And so in the midst of all this fighting, there arose a third party and they were not really liberals, but they weren't really fundamentalist either. And they were called the new evangelicals. And they basically kind of were trying to pretend that they were just a reasonable third party. And this is what the book says here in page seven years ago, a noted fundamentalist accurately declared that the new evangelicalism was born with a mood. It is difficult to define a mood, but is nonetheless very real and potent. And the mood of evangelicalism was appeasement. They were trying their best to not be a liberal, but then not be a fundamentalist either. And the book goes on to say, No doubt this mood was spawned in part by the embarrassing antics of some fundamentalists and the pugnacious and unkind spirit of others. Some fundamentalist leaders were cantankerous and very hard to get along with. And so that really, even, even today, I would say that's true about some people that call themselves fundamentalists. And, uh, you know, that just the, the desire to fight, if not sanctified and used correctly, can be very damaging to a lot of people. Uh, it's kind of like a knife. I mean, you can, you can take a knife and you can do surgery on somebody with a very sharp scalpel or sharp instrument like that. But if not used correctly, you can actually kill somebody. And so truth is kind of like that sword. It's, it's a knife that can be used surgically to cut on people and help them, but it can also harm people too. And unfortunately, there have been men who claim to be fundamentalists who I think possibly did more damage than they did good. Uh, you got guys like J. Frank Norris who actually shot and killed a man in his own office. And so if that's not an example of maybe being a little bit too mean, I don't know what is. But... That has been the case, and I think even that's true about some people today, is that some people are just way too nasty, way too strong. And so we fast forward to the 1940s, and there was a man named Harold Ockengay, and he's called the father of New Evangelicalism. And New Evangelicalism is basically characterized by six main points. And I will read these points to you. Number one a reaction to what was perceived as excessive negativism on the part of fundamentalism. Early new evangelical leaders took great pains to emphasize the fact that fundamentalists were too much against and not enough for. Their plea was, let's be positive and not negative. While this statement has an emotional appeal to many, it is not a biblical philosophy. Scripture is both positive and negative. It is for some things and against others. We must strive for that same balance. And so, like if you look at uh, Paul talking to Timothy, saying, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Uh, two, three of those are negative. Two of those three are negative. Reprove and rebuke are negative things. And so, uh, neo-evangelicalism says, well, we're just going to be exhorting all the time. We're just going to be positive all the time. And, and if you're, you know, if you want to be positive, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to preach the Bible, you have to be negative about some things. Uh, the second point was a desire to be accepted by the scholarly world. Many young fundamentalist scholars became resentful to the fact that they were not viewed with respect by fellow scholars in their uh, specific disciplines. Because they were fundamentalists, they were viewed as significantly in, uh, viewed as deficient intellectually, and their work was not recognized by the scholarly world as a whole. 
And then the last sentence says, The desire to be intellectually respectable in the eyes of a godless world has ruined many a promising scholar. What a fantastic statement to make. And so the world in its wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. That's, I believe, in 1 Corinthians. Number three, the influence of training in liberal institutions. And uh, even Vance, you know, basically they said that we need to go and get a degree from a secular university if we're going to have any validity to our Christian message. So the new evangelicals were basically emphasizing the importance of having that recognition in the secular world. And Vance Havner said this, what some people feel is their mind broadening is only their conscience stretching. And I think that's a wonderful way to put that. Number four, the general mindset and spirit of the age. And dogmatism was becoming a hated concept. There was a call for openness and the acceptance of varying viewpoints as at least viable options for the believer. New hermeneutical approaches were becoming fashionable among so-called evangelicals who hailed the ironic spirit in place of the militant spirit. This ironic spirit was the part of the warp and wolf of the new evangelicals. And so I find that very interesting uh, that they need to try to uh, not be rigid, but be uh, open to new ideas, which if you're going to do that in politics, it's compromise. Sometimes maybe you have to, but it comes to, uh, <laughs> when it comes to theology, Christianity can never accommodate the culture. It's just not possible. Number five, a reaction to the criticism that fundamentalism lacked a vision for social action. And so basically they're saying that you guys don't do anything to feed the hungry or anything to help the homeless, which if you know anything about fundamental churches, we do definitely. Uh, but it's not the main point of emphasis. The gospel is the main point of emphasis, the new birth. And then number six, a growing ecumenical spirit which viewed fundamentalists as too separatistic. And uh, basically said, you guys are just too narrow-minded and it's just, you just are off by yourself. You don't fellowship with nobody. These are good people. We have petty dif disagreements and whatever. And uh, that basically were the six points that characterized new evangelicalism. And so with the rise of new evangelicalism, there was a couple of organizations that formed. One of them was the National Association of Evangelicals and the American Council of Christian Churches. And in 1947, Fuller Theological Seminary was founded, which was basically the Bible College headquarters of New Evangelicalism. And then a little bit down the road, the New Evangelical Newsletter started circulating, and everybody knows this newsletter as Christianity Today, which is by far the most popular New Evangelical Newsletter that has ever existed. And so New Evangelicalism had its college. It was Fuller Seminary. It had its newspaper, which is Christianity Today. Now it needed its face. And then in comes a man named Billy Graham. <laughs> and everybody in the world knows who Billy Graham is. He's probably the most famous preacher of the past 100 years. Now, Harold Ockengay, the father of New Evangelicalism, gave four main points saying that these are the things that we want to accomplish and this is how we want to operate with this new movement of new evangelicalism. And the four points are as followed. Uh, number one, they were concerned about the contemporary culture that had lost touch with the true God and desired to see a revival of the Christian faith that would have a significant impact upon secular culture, which is a noble goal, no doubt. Number two, they lamented the lack of respect for evangelicalism in academic circles and desired to see a measure of respectability regained through the efforts of capable scholars who could defend Christianity on intellectual grounds. Number three, they wanted to recapture the leadership of the denominations from the liberals. And number four, they desired to see the church be an instrument in producing societal reform. So basically, to sum all that up, they said that, you know, we want to try to see people saved, which is no problem. And then number two, they said that, you know, we want to gain some sort of intellectual respectability in our movement. So we're going to emphasize education. Number three, they said, we're going to go back into these denominations and recapture them from the inside out. That's how they operate. We're, we're not coming out of these organizations. We're going to go back in them and try to push all these liberals out. And then number four, they basically wanted to try to have societal social reforms and try to, you know, try to do humanitarian things, which basically has been the entire goal of new evangelicalism. I mean, new evangelicals, when they go on missions trips, they're not really preaching the gospel. They're doing more like uh, b digging wells and feeding people and nothing wrong with that. But 
the gospel and theology must be the emphasis of our ministry, but that's not really what was going on. So in March of 1956, the publication called Christian Life characterized New Evangelicalism with eight points, and I'll give you the eight points here. Number one, they said, we have a friendly attitude towards secular science, meaning that, you know, we're going to try to maybe have a soft approach to things like evolution. Number two, a willingness to re-examine beliefs concerning the work of the Holy Spirit, which means basically that we're going to allow Pentecostalism and charismatic craziness to come to the table and be a part of us. Number three, a more tolerant attitude towards varying views on eschatology. So we're going to say that you know, end times doctrine is a secondary issue. Uh, a shift away from so-called extreme dispensationalism. An increased emphasis on scholarship, which means we're going to try to emphasize education. A more definitive recognition of social responsibility. There's your social gospel again. A reopening of the subject of biblical inspiration. Now, hang on a second. That is huge. What they're saying is, we're going to really go back and see if the Bible really is the Word of God. Uh, you, as a Christian, ought to have bells going off in your mind when you read that because that's a big deal. That's a huge deal. And then also, number eight, a growing willingness of evangelical theolog theologians to converse with liberal theologians. So basically they're saying we're going to have dialogue with liberals now. Now, when it came to their rejection of extreme dispensationalism, uh, basically what that meant was is that the dispensational view of the Bible is oftentimes negative. We do not believe that we're going to usher in this kingdom and that the world's going to get better and better and better. That's, that's really not what a dispensationalist believes or dispensationalism teaches. Um, it teaches a very pessimistic worldview. Now, remember... Neo-evangelicalism wants to emphasize the positive. They want to be, I mean, have a, a really sweet outlook of everything, and we don't want to mess with negative stuff. We don't want to talk about negative. And dispensationalism has a negative view of the world. And this, I mean, you listen, any dispensational preacher, they they don't they don't believe the social gospel. They believe that the world is Titanic and, and that it, the Titanic is sinking and everybody just needs to get on the life raft and that's what they preach and that's what they believe. And, and, and that's, that's not positive. So the new evangelicalism is rejecting dispensationalism as a whole because of that. Now, when it comes to the fellowship with theological liberals, and we have our theological liberals today, no, no doubt. A lot of them are Word of Faith people and, uh, you know, Stephen Furtick, Hillsong, Elevation, uh, Bethel, all those people. Those are your theological liberals today, largely. That, that's just a, a piece of it. But... Uh, the book says this about separating from theological liberals. This is what the book says. And I think this is great. Part of the problem with many new evangelicals is that they do not recognize theological liberals as lost souls groping in spiritual darkness. Wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. Many evangelicals simply view liberals as misguided but well-meaning Christians who need our love and fellowship. We might thus be able to lead them from their erring ways. Now, does that not sum up beautifully what most people do today? That you find a guy like, I don't know, Bill Johnson of Bethel Church, and, and you say, man, this guy is so bad on theology. And rather than calling him out and warning people that this is a wolf in sheep's clothing, what you do as a new evangelical is you go yoke up with him and you fellowship with him and hoping that you can turn him towards a better theological position. And that is not the Bible view of a false teacher. The Bible view of a false teacher is that they are wolves. They are destroying people and they need to be rebuked. They need to be called out and they don't need to be fellowshiped with. You don't endorse heresy. And this mindset of we're not going to separate from the liberals, we're going to fellowship with them, try to help them, is really the mindset that drove the philosophy of the Billy Graham ministry. Now this brings us to the main point of what is the difference between a new evangelical and a fundamentalist. Really, it's not theological. Not really. It is a idea of who practices ecclesiastical separation and who does not. Now, on paper, most new evangelicals believe orthodox views, but they fellowship with those who do not. 
And a fundamentalist, he holds to similar orthodox views as the new evangelical, but the difference is he will not fellowship with those who do not. And the book says on page 21, one of the chief differences between new evangelicals and fundamentalists concerns the view of each regarding what we call ecclesiastical separation. Now, the book says this, Why do men resist biblical injunctions to break fellowship with those who deny the faith and promote unscriptural positions? Without a doubt, one of the reasons is the fact that taking a stand against unbelief can be very costly. This was well demonstrated in the conflict that arose in some of the denominations years ago. Men had labored for most of their ministry within the bounds of a certain denominational affiliations. They had friendships, and more than that, they had financial investments. They were wedded to the denominational pension programs which they would lose if they left the fold. It was too great a price to pay for some. And so there was a price to pay to stand for truth, and the New Evangelical, for many different reasons, was not willing to do so. The book says on page 27, One cringes to read the critique of one observer, but its truthfulness must be recognized. The evangelical community scurries around attempting to curry favor from a secular world that couldn't care less. It manifests itself as pitiful rather than broad-minded, treasonous rather than accommodating, willing to abandon even the basic tenets of the faith such as the inerrancy of Scripture rather than appear unfashionable. What a thing to say about the evangelicals. Powerful stuff. And the book goes on to say, on page 28, what happens when people compromise vital truth? The institutions, churches, and movements with which they are associated deteriorate spiritually. Even such a one as Thomas Oden, a liberal, sees the danger of accommodation. The central theme of contemporary theology is accommodation to modernity, the spirit of accommodation has led to steady deterioration of a hundred years and the disaster of the last decade. So the, the question that we need to ask ourselves as Christians is, what are we willing to give up theologically so that we can reach people? Would it be best to give up nothing and reach fewer people? Or should we try to cut as many corners as we can theologically so that we don't appear unloving or uh, not cool or not hip or not fashionable, what are we willing to give up to fit in with this world? That's a good question for everybody. And Mr. Pickering says this, Paul did not set his sails to catch the winds of this world. He proclaimed the truth and relied upon the Holy Spirit to illuminate the minds of his hearers. Paul did not possess the new evangelical spirit. He was a battler for the faith, wielding the sword of the Spirit against the foes of God. Powerful stuff. I love it. Now, one of the early colleges that New Evangelicalism started was a college called Wheaton. And many people said that this was a great example of high academic standards and it was respected in the community, secular and the Christian community, as a place where, you know, this, this is a respectable intellectual institution. But because of their refusal to separate ecclesiastically from anything, they eventually began hiring people on staff who believed in evolution. And see, this is the problem that you get whenever you, you try to accommodate intellectualism and you won't separate from anybody. You literally open the door for heresy to walk in and you don't do anything about it. And we mentioned before how that J. Gresham Macon was on staff at a college and he actually came out of that and started another college called Westminster Seminary. And he was a good example of a fundamentalist. He would rather separate from a college who was infected by liberalism rather than accommodate it, which is what the new evangelicals did. They accommodated the theological liberalism and just kept going. And Fuller Theological Seminary was infected with liberalism. And one of the things that people on staff at this college were questioning was the idea of biblical inspiration. Is the Bible really inspired? And is our translation of it that we hold in our hands, is that inspired? And that was, I mean, that was a raging debate back then. And I would say it really is a raging debate even now. And so with that particular issue, you have people on one side that say the Bible is not inspired. Then you have people on the other side that say, yeah, the Bible is inspired. What are you talking about? Well, you know, that's what was going on. Liberalism and modernism were taking opposite positions on things 
And guess where the new evangelical was? He was right in the middle saying, well, you know, I don't agree with this brother, but, you know, I, I, I kind of believe this way, but I'm going to try to fellowship with both of them. And these people were like, they were perfecting the art of being in the middle of the road on everything, on every major theological issue. They were neither nor. We're just, we're just kind of middle of the road guys. And this was a problem that was in the newspapers of the day. It was in the seminaries of the day. But there were also parachurch organizations like Campus Crusade for Christ that they, they still would fellowship with these modernistic denominations. They, they were neo-evangelicals, which means, you know, they, they believed right. A lot of people got saved in the Campus Crusade for Christ Crusades. Uh, but they, they would fellowship with these denominations who did not believe that the Bible was the Word of God, which is typical neo-evangelicalism. And Harold Ockengabe made a, an incredible statement about the fundamentalist. And here in page 37, I'll just read the book to you. The NAE took a definite position against ecclesiastical separation. Its first president, Harold Ockengabe, who at that time was pastor of the Park Street Church in Boston, explained his convictions in this manner. Quote, the strategy of the fundamentalist was wrong. He had raised a shibboleth of having a pure church, both as a congregation and a denomination. The exegesis of 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18, and the parable of the tares was the basis for his ecclesiology. The sad practice called come outism developed. The belief that one should have and would find a pure church on earth caused fragmentation. And so basically, Ockengay's argument is that you're not going to agree on everything, so you may as well just all come together and work together anyway, despite all of our differences. That was basically his argument. Which sounds good to a point, but when you have people out there who deny the inspiration of the Bible and hold to evolution, am I supposed to fellowship with them just because finding a pure church is impossible? Am, am I supposed to fellowship with infidels and heretics? Just because, you know, I can't agree 100% with anybody on everything? Am I supposed to swing the pendulum that far? That is the conundrum of new evangelicalism. Because they will swing the pendulum that far and say that, well, nobody agrees 100% on everything, so the idea of ecclesiastical separation is a farce. That, that's what they say, which is a very dangerous position to take. So neo-evangelicalism started about the 1940s or so, and then in the 1960s with Christianity Today and Billy Graham, this thing had literally become the face of Christianity. It was so popular and it was literally everywhere. So Billy Graham says, you know, let's all get together and have like this world conference where all the new evangelicals can get together. So in 1966, everybody got together in new evangelicalism in Berlin, Germany. And the meeting was called the World Congress on Evangelism. And they were, they claimed that they were open and they wanted to work with everybody. But Carl McIntyre, a famous fundamentalist, was actually denied entrance to the meeting. They told him, no, you cannot go. Now, isn't it ironic that the new evangelicals who don't separate from anybody, they want a fellowship with everybody, won't let a fundamentalist in the door. And it gets even weirder than that. They actually allowed Oral Roberts to attend the meeting, but Carl McIntyre cannot. Does that sound like new evangelicals today? They will allow Bethel and Hillsong and Stephen Furtick to come to all these meetings, but if some guy actually, you know, holds to a fundamentalist position on anything, well, he's a legalist and he can't be a part of this. Now, in 1973, there was a meeting called Key 73, and basically that was a, a name they used for these certain meetings. And uh, everybody got together in new evangelicalism, but this one was different. In 1973, the new evangelical meetings started to allow Roman Catholic bishops to participate in this meeting. Now, if you know anything about Roman Catholicism, they teach a works-based salvation. They worship Mary, even though they vehemently deny that they don't, but they actually do. And they are basically, if you watch our third Adam videos, they are the face of mystery religion. These people are not Christians. Roman Catholicism is a false doctrine. But the new evangelicals, because of their overemphasis on being positive and uniting with everybody, 
they invited Roman Catholic bishops to be a part of this meeting. And the book says here, little regard was paid to the differences between apostates and believers. One brochure said, Key 73 is one hopeful sign that the battles between a defunct fundamentalism and a lifeless liberalism are now being left behind to be fought only by those who wish to live in the past. This statement, of course, only emboldened wishful thinking, namely, that fundamentalism and liberalism are dead and that we should move on to bigger and better things. In fact, there is still a deadly struggle between error as embodied in liberalism and truth as embodied in fundamentalism. So the idea that they're saying here is that if you are still fighting these old battles, then you're stuck in the past. It's time to move on. I hear that all the time today by new evangelical churches. You guys are all Oh, uh, you know, you're Granny's church and you guys are stuck in the past and it's time to, you know, get up to date with this new world that we live in now. Times have changed. That's that's been the mantra of new evangelicalism forever. So the very next year in a city called Lausanne, Switzerland, the International Congress on World Evangelism met and a significant change was made to the philosophy of ministry. They used to kind of keep it under wraps, but now they're openly teaching this. And the issue that they brought forth was something called the contextualization of the gospel, meaning that we're going to allow the culture that people live in to determine the way that we give the gospel. And this is what really was a groundbreaking idea because really back then nobody had ever thought about that. Why? Why does the gospel need to be contextualized? The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, you know, that's, that's a message. You can preach that in Russia. You can preach that in Papua New Guinea. You can go to South America and preach that. I mean, why would you need to contextualize that? That, that is a theological concept. And so basically the idea is we need to try to fit the message of the gospel to the culture rather than let the culture come up and understand the theology of the gospel. The whole thing was backwards, really. And in today's context, that would be like, okay, we want to try to reach people with the gospel who like rap music, so let's start rapping the gospel. And we want to try to reach people who like rock music, so let's put rock music to Christian words, and let's try to give Bible truth through that. That's called contextualization of the gospel. And so the book says this, what is meant by contextualization? One has said that it gives preference as the point of departure for systematic theological thinking in the contemporary historical scene over against the biblical tradition. In other words, one tries to fit the message to the people and their thinking rather than calling them to accept the thought patterns of Scripture. And so that gave rise to ideas that, you know, the reason people don't get saved is because we're not hip enough and we're not cool enough and, and we're not accommodating of the culture enough. And the implications of that were really monumental. And so this philosophy spilled over into Bible translation as well. Uh, you know, people don't understand these words in the Bible, so maybe we need to just retranslate the Bible with modern words so that they can understand it. And uh, there are actually words out there that are like ghetto gangster talk, like, you know, yo, yo, Satan was a really bad dude. That There are Bibles out there that say that, believe it or not. And uh, w where this mindset developed, it developed in new evangelicalism, especially in the Switzerland conferences. And then not only that, the Lucerne Conference in Switzerland, they had the Roman Catholics involved, but now they brought the Charismatics to the table. And so all the wild, crazy, insane things that these people have been teaching, now they're a part of the fold too, which had never happened before. And the writer of the book goes on to say this. He says, To seek organizational unity at the expense of doctrinal compromise is wrong. And to that I give a hearty amen, because doctrine matters. He even goes on to say this, It is not a mark of graciousness to allow false teaching to be propagated. And with that I say amen. So this is what new evangelicalism believed. This is what they did. And that is chapter 2, Developing the Art of Fence Straddling, written by Mr. Ernest Pickering. Guys, if you're new, go ahead and subscribe to this channel. And if you would, please share this video with your friends and family. We're going to go through every chapter of this book together and give you all the information in it. It's a great book. Uh, it's out of print, but we want the truth of this to be continued on with you guys. So go ahead and subscribe to this channel, and we will see you guys again very soon.
Have a great day.